All right, in uh, John chapter 10, I think was, is where we'll take at least our place of departure. And today we're discussing this matter of the indisputable fact of Christ's substitutionary death. And this is an important concept for us to understand. What do we mean when we speak of substitution? Now, I really believe that if we get this firmly in our minds and in our hearts, what the Scripture is saying in this regard, it in and of itself will clear up a lot of other questions we may have. We've already said that there is a, a mystery that hangs about the atonement, and really, as we have emphasized, we're dealing with redemption, which is the more typical New Testament word for the work of Christ, rather than atonement. Atonement, strictly speaking, is not a New Testament word. It's found once in our English Bible, and there... It is uh, rendered for the Greek word, which means reconciliation. So atonement means at one month or reconciliation. And of course, that's a part of Christ's work. Is this ringing? Is that my head? All right, maybe I'll turn it down a little bit. I wonder if I'm still hearing bells. So in considering Christ's redemption... His ransom, uh, which was the price that he paid for our release. Now, that is redemption. The ransom is his own precious blood. He gave himself as a lamb without spot, being verily ordained from the foundation of the world, Peter said. John pointed to him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. That's expiation. That is what redemption does. It takes away. It does not merely cover, but it removes. Now, on what principle, then, did Christ lay down his life so as to remove or take away our sin? And that principle is plainly the principle of substitution. We refer to the work of Christ as substitutionary or vicarious. Now, I'm sure you've heard many of these words. Vicarious used to have a pretty sound meaning until certain modern theologians came along and use vicarious for less than substitution. And they said that Christ's work was vicarious, that is, he merely set us an example that we ought to be self-sacrificing and loving. And of course, that in a sense is true, but that that explains the atonement of Christ or his redemption, certainly it doesn't. But that it was a substitutionary work, certainly is what the scripture is saying. But what does substitution mean? What are we talking about? And how does the scripture verify beyond any uh, dispute as far as anyone who will accept the, the word of God as the authority, teach us that Christ's redeeming work was of a substitutionary nature. Well, I'm taking uh, John uh, chapter 10 uh, as a good example of this, although certainly not the only example. We have read, I think, twice over Matthew 28, uh, is it verse uh, 10? No, verse, uh, Matthew 20, verse 28. He gave his life a ransom for many. So I'm not reading that now. Also, 1 Timothy 2, 6, he gave his life a ransom for all. Now, that's the only two places in the Bible where that particular word for uh, ransom is used. In John chapter 10, verse 11, again, the words of Christ. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Now I call your attention to the preposition for. For this is the preposition that infallibly teaches substitution. Now what for means here is substitution. Beyond any question. Now I say that because there are a lot of ways we use the word for. There are a lot of ways we use uh, various prepositions. And sometimes different uh, prepositions in the original languages are translated by the same English preposition. And seeing that there may be many meanings for an English preposition, it's important that we point out exactly what the Scripture is saying to us. I lay down my life for the sheep. Now, that is substitution. He repeats the same statement in verse 15. 
As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. Now the same meaning is in Matthew 20, 28, when he said, I came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give my life a ransom for many. And the same meaning is in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 6, when Paul said he was given a ransom for all. For here is substitution. And substitution means this, that the innocent is taking the place of the guilty in his punishment for sin. Do I have to repeat any of that? Taking the place of the guilty. Peter tells us something very interesting uh, in this regard. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24, look over. Uh, to that passage, and we get very clearly here what the Scripture is saying about substitution. Speaking of this one who in the first chapter he says was verily as a lamb delivered for us, in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24, speaking of Christ, he said, Who, now look at this, his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. Now, my friends, that is substitution. I call your attention to a few facts. Notice that Christ did this himself. Peter makes that very plain. His own self. All that Jesus as the God-man was, was acting here. He bare our sins, Peter says, plural, not merely singular, but our sins. He bare them in his own body on the tree. That is, in his death, when he died, he died in a substitutionary manner. Do you see that? You see what substitution is? I lay down my life for the sheep. Now, of course, he's using a word picture here. He says, I'm the good shepherd, and he calls his own his sheep. This shows one loving relationship. But here is what he is saying beyond all doubt. I am dying in the place of and instead of those sheep dying. Well, Peter, how, uh, how is he doing that? By bearing their sins in his own body and dying in their place, suffering what they ought to have suffered. Now, that's substitution. And this is very plainly the very heart of Christ's redemptive work as regards us. Now remember last week, and I, don't, I hope uh, that you got the significance of it, but I'm afraid that some of you didn't. There are two essential elements in Christ's atoning or redeeming work. The first element is Godward. For Christ had to affect something as far as the Father was concerned. Who was it that was sinned against? It was God, was it not? Sin had offended Him. Now I want to ask you, what kind of a work does Christ do toward His Father in His death? For He is doing something for the Father, or for the Godhead, we might say. He is God as well as man there on that tree. And he is accomplishing something Godward as well as manward. Now there's the two avenues or the two direct streets. Now toward God, John tells us, verse John 2, 1, what Jesus did toward God. And there he said that he is a propitiation for our sins. But if you were here last week, we called your attention to the fact that though the same English preposition for is used, it is an entirely different preposition in the original language than is used in any of these other places. And the word for there does not mean substitution. For God hath not sinned, and therefore there needs to be no substitution for him. Do you see how simple that is? But there needs to be propitiation toward God, and Christ is that propitiation. Now propitiation is a making of peace. That is a reconciliation. If you want the word atonement, that's what it is. 
It is a, a making of peace. And that is what Jesus Christ did Godward. He appeased. Now that's far too light a word. But he quelled, if you, if you want to look at it this way, the storm that was in the bosom of God because of sin. The storm that was there in his holiness that was occasioned by the sin of the creature. And God's holiness had gotten upset as it must of necessity at sin. He's a pure eyes to even look on sin. And his wrath was kindled. But his, it, it was a disturbance within his own being that must be propitiated. That is, that storm must be quieted within the person of the Godhead. Now, we're speaking in human words. But these are the very words uh, that Scripture reveals. And so I know at best they're only a human conception. And John says that he's a propitiation concerning our sin. Not for, there's no idea of substitution. Concerning our sins, and he said, not concerning ours only, but also concerning the sins of the whole world. And as I said, you can make that as universal as you want to. God is more pleased with the death of Christ than he was displeased with all the sins of mankind and also all the sins of Satan and his fallen angels, all the sins of all created beings. God was propitiated. Now that does not mean that Christ was a substitution for all of those offending sinners. No, very definitely not. I know that he was not a substitution for the devil or for the fallen angels, for Scripture reveals that he was not. He did not take on himself the nature of angels, the writer of the book of Hebrews says. Though he is a propitiation, he certainly is no substitute for them. And had he been a substitute for them, then they must of necessity be redeemed. But being a propitiation and a substitute are two entirely different concepts. And there is a sense in which all of mankind was reconciled unto God by the death of Jesus Christ, in the sense that Christ was a propitiation concerning all sin. And check that out. That is uh, the Greek preposition peri, in case you're concerned. You can check that up in the Greek lexicon. It means about or concerning for our sins. But here... In substitution is something else. When Jesus said, I lay down my life for the sheep, he didn't say concerning the sheep, but rather for them. That is, in their place and in their stead. For there's not only propitiation for, as I said last week, and I believe it's true to Scripture, had Christ only been a propitiation, we all still would have of necessity perished. For though God was appeased, Propitiation does not take away our sin. It may appease the Godhead, but it doesn't remove our guilt. And somebody says, well, now, if God's propitiated, how is it that anybody suffers in hell? Men do not suffer in hell in order to propitiate God. In fact, the suffering of the finite creature, be it all of mankind, could have never appeased God. Because it's impossible for the finite to appease the infinite, and God is infinite, and he was infinitely disturbed at sin, being infinite himself. And only the sacrifice of Christ could appease or make propitiation toward God. Now that he is more than satisfied in the work of Christ concerning all sin, yes. And if that's all that you're meaning... Uh, by insisting upon certain universal terms in the Scripture, then uh, as far as I'm concerned, you're not at variance with me or the Word of God. But where the problem is, is when you try to make substitution universal. For there, the Scripture is against you, and it does not. Jesus said, I lay down my life for the sheep in their place. And Peter says, he bare our sins in his own body on the tree. And this substitution is really, as far as we're concerned, the primary work uh, of Christ for us. Here's where we enter the picture in the matter of substitution. Now, this element of substitution is not new. In fact, the death of Christ is the grand fulfillment of, of the whole doctrine of substitution that uh, runs throughout all the Old Testament. And I say that it is this principle of substitution, are you listening? that explains all the Old Testament sacrifices for sin, as far as men were concerned. There were various orders of sacrifices. Some of them reflect propitiation. 
For instance, the sweet incense or the sweet savor off were Godward. But the sin offerings were manward. Trace that through the Old Testament, see if it's not so. There were some offerings that were as sweet incense that arose to God. Man wasn't concerned with those. But there were other offerings that did affect, for uh, the men for whom they were offered, uh, some blessings that God gave on the basis of those sacrifices. And it's this principle of substitution that lies behind all the offerings of the Old Testament. Look at Genesis 4.4. 4. We won't turn here. Uh, I'm just mentioning these. If you have this outline, you've got them there. Here Abel brings a bloody sacrifice to God. And it is the innocent dying for the guilty. Abel there is saying to God, God, I, I'm recognizing the fact that I'm a sinner and that I deserve death. But rather than, than I die in myself, this lamb or whatever he brought is going to die. And the Bible says that unto Abel and his offering God had respect. Why? Because there was a principle of substitution. Now why did Cain have his offering rejected? Because it was an offering that did not allow for substitution. It was the fruit of the ground. Uh, the, uh, it was the uh, fruit of his own work. And there can be no substitution there, you see. Uh, there can be no uh, imputed guilt in an, in an offering like that. In fact, he's bragging as he comes before God. It wasn't that God merely preferred lambs to, to fruit. It was substitution. And this is why that the blood is important. Now, why the blood? Now look at Leviticus 17.11. By the way, you can go all the way through the sacrifices. But as Hebrews tells us, almost all things were purged by blood in the Old Testament. Now, we've gotten acquainted with that, and we're used to it, but it does seem strange. You take people uh, from outside uh, scriptural uh, ranks, and they often wonder, why all this bloody religion, you know? I'm sure that must have been a gory place, that brazen altar where so much blood was shed. Aren't you sure it was? Uh, did the Jews just prefer this? And yet look at men, uh, all pagan religions, they seem to know that it takes blood. Some of them even to the point of sacrificing their own children and shedding their blood. Why blood? Well, God said, uh, you're not to eat of the blood. I've given it to you upon your altars, that it may make an atonement for your soul. Why? Because the blood is the life of the flesh. And when you bring a bloody sacrifice, you're saying, another life is being laid down instead of mine. And that's substitution. That's why God accepted that blood. Because it pointed to substitution. And this is true of all the bloody offerings. There are many offerings of the scripture, some of which are not substitutionary in nature, I've already said, but the substitutionary offerings were blood sacrifices. Sometimes uh, it's true that there was a scapegoat that escaped, but this, this showed two aspects of Christ's atonement and carrying our sins away and dying. And of course, one animal couldn't do both, but Christ, as the Lamb of God, did both. But there's always the blood element. There's always this principle of substitution. And here's a fact I want to call to your attention, and it may set you upon some study. I hope that it does. But I want you to search all the Old Testament and see if you can do something for me. See if you can find a single blood sacrifice in the Old Testament. A sacrifice that showed substitution. Are you listening? you got Bibles, I think almost all of you. And see if you can show me one single blood sacrifice in the Old Testament that was general in its nature and was not particular in its nature. Now you say, what do you mean by general? I mean an offering that was just offered generally for sins, for anybody or everybody. Or see if you find offerings that were offered for a particular person or for particular people. And I believe when you go all the way through, because you see, substitution has no meaning unless it is particular. A substitution that's general is not substitution. That's a contradiction of terms. Again, you've got to think about that for a while. But search the Scriptures. For the Scripture is the rule. For instance, I, there in Genesis 4.4, 4, there was an offering for one man. You see, Abel's offering didn't atone for Cain, did it? Cain would have had to have his own offering. 
Abel's offering was particular. You'll find many sacrifices that were offered for individuals in the Old Testament. Now, that's not where the truth ends. But it starts there, with the individual. Now, some sacrifices indeed could be for a house. We come to the Passover uh, in the land of Egypt, and there you find a lamb for a house. But I ask you, is that general or particular? It's particular. It's for a specific house. True, God said if, if uh, if the house be too poor, two houses could go together in one lamb. But still, that's one lamb for two particular houses. And there you can go until you find the most general sacrifice. And really, it's not general in the, in the first sense of the word. The, or let, me, let me use a different word then. The most universal sacrifice you find in the Old Testament economy is where one sacrifice was made for a nation. On the Day of Atonement, a sacrifice was made for a nation. But it was not made for all nations or for any nation. It was made for a particular nation. Now, there's a great lesson to be taught in this particularity of the Old Testament sacrifice. Well, you say, preacher, those are types and symbols at best. Yes, they are. I agree with you. And it's impossible that the blood of bulls or goats should ever take away sin. I say, amen. But that Christ's redemptive work is a direct relationship and a direct uh, teaching and answer to the Old Testament sacrifice, I must say it is. For God was teaching concerning the Lamb of God, John said, who was to come. Who was to take away the sin of the world. And by the word world, and, and he said world, cosmos, which is the word, excuse me, that the Holy Spirit intended to use. So that by that we know that Christ was not merely sacrificed for one nation alone, that is for Israel, although the Jews certainly probably never thought about the Messiah. If they ever gained insight that he was going to die, they never thought about him dying for Gentiles too. They never thought that. So he's the sin, of the, he's the sin offering for the world, that is for a particular people throughout all nations rather than just for Israel. And John chapter 11 puts it this way, For the children of God scattered abroad, Jesus died for them rather than all of them dying. Study that whole context where the high priest makes that prophecy and said, You know nothing at all. It is expedient that one man die and rather than the whole nation should die. And then the Holy Spirit said, The high priest didn't say this of himself. He said a lot more than he, ever, than he knew he was saying. But being the high priest that year, he prophesied. And here's what that prophecy meant. That Jesus, as the Lamb, was to die, not for that nation alone, but for all the children of God scattered abroad. Now, universal in one aspect, certainly. That is, all nations there are considered. But it is not a general offering. That is, for any and for all. It is particular for all the children of God scattered abroad. For substitution must be particular by its very nature. So from Abel, one man, to an atonement on the, uh, uh, for a nation, yet each particular, none general, then Christ's work must be particular rather than general, and that's exactly what is foretold. Isaiah chapter 53 is the high water mark of Old Testament prophecy regarding the work of Christ. And there, the prophet looking down through the centuries gets such a high view of Christ's death and such a clear view that he says that his soul was made an offering for sin. Isn't that what Peter said when he said, He in his own body bear our sins on the tree. He his own self, you see, his own soul, uh, his very nature offered up unto God. And yet he's bearing our sins. All right, read Isaiah. What is it? And ask yourself, is it particular or general? For us all, Isaiah is saying. And finally says, he shall justify many. All the way through. Not that there aren't some universals used. For instance, all. But what is the implication of the word all in such a context? Is a fair question to ask. So Isaiah presents a particular redemption in regards to the work of Christ as it's prophesied. And then you'll find, I gave you these scriptures, uh, I don't know that we'll go over all of them, 
But this is the way it's understood. Peter said uh, concerning the work of Christ and the blessings of that work in Acts 2.39, he said to uh, uh, true Jews uh, scattered uh, all over and gathered there, he said, the promise is unto you. Now that's particular. And then he went on and said to your children. Now that's particular. And then he said to as many as the Lord our God shall call. Now that's particular. That gets broader, but it's still particular. As many as the Lord our God is going to call. The promise is to you, to your children. And by the way, uh, I'll close the door here in case somebody's wanting to go through it. The promise is to our children. That's true. But not to our children as children. You get the difference? For instance, uh, some of our Presbyterian brethren and others uh, will say, all right, the promise is to our children, then I'll baptize my child because that's, that shows that the promise is to him. Well, it is to him, but not to him as a child. In other words, the implication is plainly, even as he says to as many as the Lord our God shall call, and those many who are scattered, wherever they may be, that in time eventually will be called, and of course there the calling is by the Spirit of, of God, whereby we're called. But when that child grows up, that is, to understand the gospel himself, and is called by the Holy Spirit, the promise is for him. But not as he's a baby, of course. Not as an, uh, as a, as an ununderstanding, unknowing baby. Uh, there's no room there at all to uh, give any room for anybody that wanted to baptize their baby. And I would say this, that sometimes Baptists are just about as bad as dedicating their babies, you see. We all dedicate them in our hearts. But if you think some outward ritual is going to get that baby close to God, you're mistaken. For salvation is a particular business. It's individual. Parents are, are, are to be concerned over the children. But parents, here's one thing you're going to have to know. You cannot save the soul of any of your children. You can raise them and train them and give them the gospel and pray for them. And you're to do that or be guilty before God. But in order for that child ever to know the Lord, they don't know the Lord because they were born to you, a Christian parent. And they don't know the Lord simply because they're raised up in our Sunday school or somebody else's Sunday school. And they don't necessarily know the Lord simply because they make a profession of faith knowing nothing else. They know the Lord when the Holy Spirit calls them and reveals Jesus Christ in them the same way it happened to you if you're truly saved. And that's the only way anybody knows the Lord. It is general in this sense. It certainly is sufficient for any and for all. But it is particular in this means and in this respect. Christ bore our sins, and he bore them in such a way as to take them away, expiate them. And I would like for you to explain to me, if you can, how that you can have particular substitution and at the same time a general redemption. Explain how that's possible. That many say that's true. Uh, yes, they do, but I don't know on what grounds they say it. Often many who talk the most about rightly dividing the Word of God will not divide it here. They take things that are not alike and put them together as though they're alike, and they take things that are really different, uh, and they don't recognize their difference. There's a difference between propitiation and substitution, and you cannot join those two together. That they both are in the work of Christ, that's true. That he did both at the same time, that's true. That both of those things are synonymous and mean the same, no. One is Godward, one is towards man. Now Christ's death then was personal substitution. Matthew twenty twenty eight. He says that the Son of Man shall give his life a ransom for many. Now the word for there means in their place, in their stead, in their room. For instance, we, we know this type of substitution in a way. And in a way, the way it's applied to Christ, we don't even know what that is. That is, we have no human parallel. But that the scripture says this is what Christ was doing... It's not a matter to be reasoned out. It's a matter whether you either accept it or you don't. He said, I lay down my life. I, I give my life a ransom for. And ransom means a payment price. All right. Now, this doesn't explain all, but maybe this will help show you what substitution is. For instance, now, how many of you owe any money to anybody? Let me see. I can raise my hand. I do. A few of you do. 
I'm not trying to get at you personally. If you don't want to raise your hand, that's all right. Okay. Now, how many of you, I won't, I won't have you raise your hand here. How many of you, if you thought that I might go pay your bill, you might tell me where it was and who you owed it to, if you thought I might go pay it? And again, I won't know where your hand, but I have an idea. Some of you might even do that. Some of you wouldn't, but some of you might. Now, how many of you, I won't, I won't have you raise your hand here. How many of you, if you thought that I might go pay your bill, you might tell me where it was and who you owed it to, if you thought I might go pay it. And again, I won't know where your hand, but I have an idea. Some of you might even do that. Some of you wouldn't, but some of you might say, you know, if the preacher wanted to pay my, my debt, I'd let him. Suppose you owe uh, somebody down here at the uh, Pioneer Bank and Trust Company, and I do, maybe some others do too. All right, now, uh, I owe it. It's my debt. I signed a contract and uh, legally made it. But I'll tell you what. That banker would let you if you wanted to, go in there at, uh, at the next car payment when it's due for me, and if you laid down your money and said, I want to pay that money for uh, Preacher Moore up at Bible Baptist Church, he'd take your money. Wouldn't be any question about it. Uh, you could do that. Because your money just goes to my money, and all he wants is the money. So he would take your money, and if I went in to make that payment, I would know it. If you paid the whole thing off and said, look, I want to pay it off, cancel the thing, and you, then you came and gave me a canceled contract, it wasn't my money that paid it, but it'd still be paid. And the banker couldn't care. I mean, he might be suspicious, but if you convinced him that you wanted to do this out of genuine goodness and you weren't trying to do anything shifty, he'd probably take your money because money ends the debt and that's all he's interested in. Well, in one sense, Christ's work for us is a commercial transaction. It's more than that. That kind of substitution we know, and that this is the very language in which Scripture is put. For instance, to redeem means to buy with a price. You're not your own, Paul said. You're bought with a price. Now, there you are. You see, I didn't make that up out of whole fabric. That's in the Scripture. So Christ bought us with a price. That is, He paid for us. Now, let me ask you something. If you went and paid my debt and the banker accepted it, now, if he said, you go away, you're crazy, I don't, uh, nobody's ever paid anybody's car off, and I won't take it. Well, all right, you wouldn't pay it. But if he took it, and you paid it, uh, could he then, he gives you the canceled note, you take it and give it to me. Or maybe you just keep it yourself. But if you give it to me, and I know now what you've done, could that banker then write me a hot note and say, look, your car payment's overdue. And I want you to hightail it down here, and I want you to get your money in. And I go down there, and I wave that note at him and say, Look, I didn't pay it, but somebody else paid it. I've got the canceled note. And if you want to, take me to court. I've got this canceled note. Can he make me pay it again? Well, of course not. Now, we understand that. He couldn't collect it at your hand and my hand both. He's got to take it either at my hand or your hand. I rightfully owe it. But if you pay it and he takes it, he can't collect it from me again. Now, this is one aspect of substitution. That is, if Christ bore my sins in his own body on the tree, and that's what Peter said he did, and if he laid down his life for the sheep in the sheep's place in their stead, suffering the death that they ought to suffer, only do it in their place, if he gave himself a ransom for many, a ransom for all, can God then justly go back and collect at the hand of the debtor what Christ has already paid? Of course, the answer is no. That's double jeopardy. The law wouldn't allow it to do that. Now, that's just one aspect. I think we understand that aspect. But I do say it's important that these are some of the very terms in which our redemption is put in Scripture. And if God had not wanted us to understand at least that meaning of it, I don't believe He would have put it so plainly in terms that we do readily understand. We know what pain, a price, uh, uh, which is a commercial transaction, a ransom price, thus setting free those that are redeemed. But here is another aspect of Christ's work that we don't know. For instance, suppose I've got, maybe it's my brother. Suppose my brother murders someone, and they lock him up. And suppose he's under the death penalty, which uh, we're supposing a lot here now, aren't we? But suppose he's, he's condemned to die. He self-confessed he's guilty. He's taken another man's life, and the law says he must die. 
Suppose I go up to wherever they've got him and I go to the judge and I say, Judge, that man's my brother and I love him and he's guilty and I know it. But Judge, I am willing to die in his place and therefore you set him free. Now according to our laws, and all human laws I know anything about, I wouldn't be permitted to do that. For though I may bear your commercial debt, for morality has nothing to do with that necessarily. It would not be legal nor right. Law would not really be satisfied, though I died instead of my brother, because he's guilty and I'm not. And the law wouldn't permit that. I may be well-meaning and well-intentioned, but the fact of the matter is, where you're dealing with moral crimes, there's no satisfaction for the law there. In commercial transactions, there's satisfaction. If the debt is paid, that's it. But this type of substitution Christ has accomplished for us. The commercial, yes, because it's put in commercial language. Therefore, I can say, well, praise the Lord, my debt is gone. It's paid. Jesus paid it. God can't collect it twice at me. But wait a minute, it's more than a debt. It's guilt. I not only owed God something, I'm guilty. We know what it is for one person to pay a debt for another person, but do we know what it is for one person to bear the guilt of another person? Now, I don't believe we do. Because our law doesn't allow for that. But my friends, the Bible says that Jesus Christ became guilty for me. And that's far more than him just paying my debt. His soul was made an offering for sin. And a righteous God, who by no means would clear the guilty without being satisfied, he can't, and he won't. Justice won't permit him. Yet he has accepted the death of Christ on the behalf of guilty sinners. He's done it justly, though far beyond my comprehension. I don't understand it. He did it by substitution. That is, Christ bare my sins in his own body. I can't conceive of that. You talk about faith, I've just got to accept that by faith. I say, Lord, how is it that you are so righteous and so holy that unless I, a guilty sinner, perfectly kept your law, I must be condemned? And yet now, beyond my understanding, when I haven't kept your law and I'm guilty, Yet another person has borne my guilt that you now accept his work in my place. Now my mind just spins at that, and I don't know, I just can't take that in. But that that is the truth of what the Bible says, I know it is, and I believe you do too if you're a redeemed sinner. But now here's an important difference. What's the difference between those? And, and we've got both, remember. We've got both because salvation is likened to that. Not only... You see, as he uh, became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him, there's a moral transaction. As well as a commercial transaction, we're bought with a price. He gave his life a ransom, and actually the ransom takes in both. The ransom is both a, trans a commercial transaction as well as a moral transaction involving those that are under bondage which implies guilt as well. But here's the difference. And I believe Scripture gives us both of these so that we don't go to any fool extreme. Now, why is it that people must go to one fool extreme or another? I reject as unscriptural a general ransom theory of the atonement. It is not taught in Scripture. I also reject as unscriptural uh, any type of limited atonement that takes away the sufficiency of the work of Christ on behalf of, of all men generally in a, in a real way. In other words, there is propitiation in that atonement. There's also substitution in that atonement. Some people say, well, now, if Christ died for me, then, then I was saved right there at Calvary. Well, in a certain sense, this certainly is true. We sang that song, He bought my soul at Calvary. 
And that's true. He, he transacted for us at Calvary. But wait a minute. When was your soul saved? Does that mean that you were born in this world saved? Oh, no. But the Bible says we were children of wrath just like others. That Christ laid down his life for the sheep, for his people, for the church, and ransomed his church with his own precious blood. This is stated in Scripture. But I must not go to a full extreme and say, well, then, whoever Christ died for, they're saved already. For God, in accepting Christ on behalf of my guilt, is not automatically obligated to set the guilty free the same way he is automatically obligated merely by a financial transaction. Now God is free, if you please, to stipulate on what basis he now will grant mercy. For instance, if the judge were to accept my death in the place of my brothers, if, in that, humanly speaking, that's impossible, but if he were to do that, then he, uh, he wouldn't necessarily have to turn my brother loose. You see, because there's no real way that, I can, that, he, that I'm actually dying for him and, and making it the same thing as if I paid money. He might say, well, now I'll let you do this, and, I'm, and when, when it's time for uh, him to die, you'll die instead of him. But because he is guilty, uh, I'll still leave him in jail ten years and then turn him loose. Or I may fine him a thousand dollars and then turn him loose. The judge, were, we, were he to accept that, could put whatever conditions he wants to. Now here's what God has done. And this is revealed plainly in Scripture. He bare our sins in his own body on a principle of substitution in such a way that satisfied God for my guilt. And he also paid the price of my redemption in such a way as that I owe nothing before the bar of God's justice. But God has stipulated now a provision that is just as plain as any other provision. And that is this, that I as a guilty sinner, Christ having died in my place, having paid my debt, Yet I must come to repentance and to faith in that one who laid down his life for me. And that I still remain a child of wrath, although one has died in my place, until I repent and believe. And it is by this process of repentance and faith that I am actually saved and brought into a lively relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, if that's not what the Bible says, saying, I just don't know what the Bible says. That is what the Scripture says. But by the same token, in the death of Christ was not only a payment for my sin, and not only a payment for my guilt, but was also a purchasing for me, a guarantee and a, and a right, if you please. To have the Holy Spirit in time come and call me to himself. And my salvation is guaranteed in the cross, that's for sure. But that it actually happens at the cross, no. Salvation for, for me did not actually happen until I embrace Christ in faith. And I'll go on further. If I do not embrace Christ in faith, then I have no salvation. Now we're dealing here with the atonement. We will deal afterwards with the call of the Spirit. But I want you to understand this. Because there are excesses to which people go on this. I believe in Christ's substitutionary work and in that it is particular. His redemption is particular. That is, he died for particular sinners. There's no doubt. Known unto God are those sinners, yes. That he is a propitiation for all men, yes. That he's a substitution for all men, oh no. He's only a substitution for believers. And that this is often expressed in the Scripture is beyond all doubt. So that Paul even says that we were quickened with Christ, raised up with Christ and seated with Christ. But that this does not become real to me until I, by the Spirit, have believed on Christ. It's certainly taught in Scripture too. This will do two things. And I see that my time's getting away, so I'm going to close. I wouldn't want to run that fellow late. Just follow me. Number one, it assures me 
having come to Christ, that my sin debt and my sin guilt is all taken away, full and complete, and that I'll never be guilty before God. But number two, it lets all sinners know that no sinner can trust that this has happened for him outside of repentance and faith. Those are necessary, and those must be. You can believe what you will about what Christ did do or didn't do for you, but unless you have embraced Him in faith, you'll stand before the Lord without a substitute and without a payment having been made for you. And you will be guilty before God condemned, in spite of what Christ has done. So the only thing that guarantees the fact that you're in Christ is the fact that you're of your faith and that you have believed on Him. Now, what guarantees your faith? And here's the point where we differ with those who have our, our Arminian persuasion. Is that faith itself is purchased for us and guaranteed us in the atoning work of Christ. And thus is gracious and is a work of the Spirit and is not a human work of itself. For I read, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So that salvation from beginning to end is a free grace. But man is still responsible even in the gospel. And he's responsible to repent and believe the gospel. Every sinner who does, yes, he is an elect sinner. That's for sure. Every sinner who doesn't, he's not an elect sinner. That's for sure. But any sinner who will believe on Christ may. And then by the fact that he believes, he has perfect assurance that Christ is his perfect Redeemer. Let's bow our heads in prayer. We will speak further in the next uh, week and even in the message this morning on uh, laying a little groundwork. But next Sunday we'll consider the call of the Holy Spirit. That is, how we are brought to faith. I don't know exactly, but I suppose these classes will last two or three more weeks. Although, don't hold me to that if it lasts a little longer. Because I want to cover all the material we need to cover. We spent three weeks now on the atonement, and I hope that, uh, I know all questions haven't been answered, but I hope that some, and if you will get these distinguishable facts in your mind, many difficulties will be settled. Shall we pray? Father, bless your word to our hearts. We're thankful for thy substitutionary work, which was on our behalf. We're thankful that Christ bear our sins in his own body. And as we stand before thee this morning, having been called by the Spirit into faith in Christ, we rejoice that our sins are fully remitted, taken away, and that we have a perfect standing with thee because of the blood of thy Son. Lord, we pray for those that have not yet come to such faith, and we would ask, Lord, that even some today, through thy word and and through the preaching of thy word, would be able to come by thy spirit to release in joy that is in Jesus Christ our Lord. We ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.